So I'm here with John Walker, who was the man responsible for the logistics and planning of the circumnavigation of the globe by Cable and Wireless Adventurer. And as we know, the CA's library is full of fantastic information, charts, books, over 10,000 pieces of information that is a valuable resource for anyone who's doing any passage planning, long haul or short haul cruising. And I'm interested in finding out from John where these charts came from that he's recently donated to the chart library and, uh, and how they came to be used with the uh, circumnavigation of the world. So John, can you tell us a bit more about the charts and how they came into being? Yeah, sure. What I was happy to hand over to the CA recently was the, the, the rump, if you like, of the 2,400 charts that we had to acquire before we took, a, took our voyage around the world. When we, this, this thing was three or four years in the planning and we had to look after a number of different aspects. Firstly, we had to find a vessel that would do the job. And for that, we wanted something that was slippery, that would do three and a half thousand miles between bunkering to allow us to do transoceanic legs. Uh, but we also had to follow a duty of care, not only to the paying patrons that we took on board, and that was always the plan, uh, but also to our sponsors, and in this case, Cable and Wireless, who ran one of the world's biggest cable laying fleets. And clearly their marine division was quite, um, quite uh, how can I say, specific about how they expected us to build the boat and to operate it. We used to joke about it. Uh, it was classified like a yacht. It was built like a workboat and run like a warship. How big was it? It was 35 metres long, 115 feet long, 41 feet in the beam, which was quite interesting uh, because it meant that we couldn't hit, haul it out on any conventional lift. It had to come up on a slipway, carriage slipway. Um, so when we looked at this thing, the object was to build it in the United Kingdom. We awarded, having got the design contract placed with Nigel Irons, we then placed the build contract or major aspects of the build contract with Fosper Thornycroft in Southampton. And we did that for two or three reasons. Firstly, because it was very lo close locally, geographically locally to my office and the centre of the operation. And secondly, they were just pitching for what would become the largest trimaran warship that had ever been built, Triton, which was being um, specified at the time. And they were quite interested and quite keen on building a trimaran motorboat. Um, whether they quite realised what they were getting into with us, I don't know, but they certainly did by the end of it. We actually project managed the build. Um, they did aspects of the build, but we made it work. Um, so when we thought about how we were going to get this thing around the world, planning the route was one thing, but inevitably, even with modern electronic charting devices, and we had about four different levels of electronic chart data available to us, nothing replaces the old paper chart mark one finger, the mark one eyeball, parallel rules. Um, we have had obviously carried a sextant with the vessel because three of our crew, the permanent crew on board the boat, were all master mariners and basically speaking, knew what they were looking at. So we finished up with, as I said, 2,400 paper charts, admiralty charts primarily, although we had some rather oddball stuff from different parts of the world as well. And they traveled around the world with us. When we got back, um, they were dispersed in different ways. We were quite lucky to the extent that we didn't have to actually buy 2,400 of them at £15 a throw. Uh, we were lucky because our sponsor was just decommissioning one of their cable ships, their cable laying vessels. So they donated to us a, about 2,000 of the charts that we needed, uh, which was an enormous help and a guidance for us. That's a lot of paper, isn't it? Oh, and that, that many charts um, creates different problems. Um, space and weight and managing that much paper is no easy task. Um, and when I delivered the last 65 or 70 charts to the CA, that was about as many as you'd want to carry anywhere distance far. Um, when, when, when they all turned up back in my office at the end of the, of the um, circumnavigation, they occupied more space than we actually thought they were ever going to. <laughs> so large paper charts, there is no substitute for them. Some of them were early, early print runs um, and they were the most amazing. They were coloured, they had the old original um, waypoints uh, and particularly points of um, reference when making passage and making and closing the coast. 
to the extent that they would give you a range of mountains where, you know, the mountain over the port that you were heading for, which you don't see on charts these days. So we had some historical references and we were working those alongside the most up-to-date electronic charting. We had a complete set of Transas specified um, ECDIS charts, which was in turn a um, benefit um, from the peace dividend because they were all Russian origin, which is interesting. <laughs> most of Transas chart, uh, electronic chart bases are Russian. Uh, we had an American um, chart base from uh, Raytheon, Raymarine as it is. Um, we had all sorts of different uh, bits of equipment. Uh, Norwegians gave us wave monitoring equipment. We had weather um, input from the United Kingdom and the, the vessel, of course, was built here in the UK uh, with engines that, although Cummings was an American builder, the engines were themselves were built in the Northeast. What we tried to do was to have a completely um, comprehensive English build program, British built. It would have been fantastic had we been able to get Lloyds to class classify the vessel, because that was one of the other aspects that we had to do. The duty of care that we had to the sponsor was that we had to build a vessel that was built to class because class gave the parameters for safety of construction and safety of operation. Uh, we tried to get it done through Lloyds, but unfortunately Lloyds weren't swift of foot and we had to dump them and go with DNV, uh, Det Norske Veritas in, uh, from Norway, who were very appreciative of what we were trying to do and could react quickly. Can you tell me what's happened to the boat? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, it was never designed as a one-trick pony, this particular boat. Uh, we kept it after the, the Round the World uh, exercise. We then ran it as a charter vessel. We took it across the Atlantic four times afterwards on different charters. One of them was um, filming Lenny Henry and Tony Bullimore on their Ill, slightly ill-fated transatlantic <laughs> sailing trip. Um, we did an enormous amount of subsea survey work in the oil fields of, of the world. She went up to the to the Arctic Circle, ran up through the Norwegian Sea. Um, we took a we were going to take her down to Venezuela um, and working for Shell, uh, but having done a lot of charter work, she then um, was mothballed in Southampton. And the problem with charter is that in the, in the blink of an eye, you go from an asset earning money to a liability costing money. So when the charter income ran out, the commercial charter income ran out. We we uh, mothballed her. She was then bought by a South African, lovely South African guy, sailing man, um, who decided he wanted her, rang me up out of the blue one day and said, um, we'd like uh, to come and look at her and we'd quite like to buy her. Right, fine. So he came over, um, 14 days later, we shook hands on the deal. Three weeks later, he turned up with 12 of his friends. We did a quick and dirty refit on the boat um, and he then sailed it to the to Cape Town, and he then ran it as a an ex uh, sorry as an expedition boat. It was running out of the uh, Victoria waterfront in Cape Town. It was doing fourteen day rollovers up to Madagascar, surfing and um, underwater diving and exploration in the trench between Madagascar and mainland Africa. It was then used by film companies in South Africa. It followed the, the uh, big fish migrations up the East Coast. And then it was sold to um, Sea Shepherd, which we laughingly describe as the paramilitary wing of Greenpeace. Um, that's not in any way, shape or form derogatory. They're completely different organisations. Sea Shepherd do have a reputation of being slightly in your face. And it was one of their other boats that, if you remember, got run over by a Japanese whaling ship and Adventurer became the latest in their all-purpose, all-weather, all-ocean cover. Uh, they rechristened her Gojira, and subsequently she has become Brigitte Bardo, and she's been working in the um, Southern Ocean, in the North Pacific, North Atlantic, and in the Mediterranean. And she spends her summers in the Med, chasing the um, villainous tuna fishermen off the Italian coast. Oh shouldn't really say that. No, she, not really. <laughs> but, she, but she's being used now um, and she's still working her tail off and that's exactly how we designed her to do. Isn't that a wonderful story? Thank you so much for sharing that with us and I'm, the CA are absolutely thrilled to bits to have some of the legacy of the, the charts that uh, she carried around the world. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks, John.